my little spiel. Alrighty, so hi everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's presentation, Why Garden Off the Ground off the ground. That was correct the first time. Um, my name is Nadia. I'm a librarian with the adult programming department at the Woodbridge Public Library. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns throughout the presentation, I'm listed as WPL librarian. So feel free to direct message me in the chat. Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to give me a little bit more information. All your cameras have been turned off and your mics have been muted to help with the sound quality and to help us all stay focused on the presentation. Again, if you have any comments or questions about the presentation throughout the throughout the presentation, please send them to the chat. We're going to be doing a little Q&A following the presentation. Uh, to stay updated on our upcoming events, please check out our Facebook, Instagram, or website, wilbridgelibrary.org. And now, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Rutgers Master Gardener, Pat Donahue. Hi, everybody. Give me a second to get set up. We practiced this before, so it should work. But I have to do that. Okay, Nadja, I can't see anybody anymore. So if you could please tell me if it looks okay at your end. Okay. So far, I still see you. I don't see the presentation. Why is that? It That's did work, right. everybody. Take our it work for it. It did work. We just did this before. And it was rehearsal and it worked. And it works. Let's try it again. Okay. Now uh -huh. I see the PowerPoint. But now I have to do that. And now oh, you should good. only see one screen, correct? Correct. Okay. Let me remove this. Okay, um, so before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I spent 15 years in government and corporate positions in environmental protection, and then I became a public school science teacher. I was in the classroom for about 22 years. And after I retired, another fellow retiree, uh, she and I decided that we were going to get our master gardening certificates. And uh, it took about 15 months, it's a program with Middlesex County. And I ended up uh, in what's called their Speakers Bureau. And I put together and give a variety of presentations. And the, your library uh, requested a speaker. And so that's how you ended up with me. And today's topic is why garden off the ground. And I'm going to be talking about raised beds, uh, containers and straw bale gardening. Um, all of which occur above the ground. So, let me, okay, so what is raised bed gardening? Well, it's basically growing plants higher than the surface of the ground. Commonly, it's done with some sort of a frame or an enclosure, and we're going to go over some of the materials that can be used. Uh, it's a convenient and easy way to grow uh, just about anything, vegetables, flowers, and it's a great alternative for people who don't have a lot of space, um, have lousy soil, uh, inadequate drainage, which is my problem at my house. It's a very wet property. Or if you have physical limitations. So when I first put this presentation together, I was asked to do it uh, by the Monroe uh, Senior Center. And they wanted um, a particular look at what they could do um, for members who had mobility issues. And so I've left some of that in because I think it's important. Okay, so I'm gonna start with raised beds. And there's basically two types of raised beds. There's what's called a formal bed or an informal bed. Now I recently had a conversation with someone about their informal bed and they weren't particularly happy with it. And so I suggested that if you neaten the edge, make it a crisp edge, um, that it can look much neater. It doesn't have to look as informal as this one. Uh, most folks prefer the formal. Uh, the ones in my backyard, um, I think all of them, with one, two exceptions, um, all of mine are informal, but I've gone through that extra step of really delineating where the grass ends and where the bed begins to make it look a little bit neater. 
So why would you use a raised bed? There are a lot of advantages. Uh, you can create them just about anywhere. Um, if you have poor or contaminated soil, uh, it is a great way to avoid that. They, once they're set up, now mind you, it is labor to set it up, but once it's set up, they're really labor saving, uh, mostly because the plants can do much better. They have better air circulation, better soil quality, the drainage is better, you have easier access, it's easier to control weeds, um, you can grow more in less space, and if you want to get really fancy at it, which I have not, you can actually put different soils in different beds and match them to your plants. So the first thing you need to consider is where are you going to put it? So you have to do a little site analysis. And the very first thing you need to look at is how much sun do you have where you think you want your bed. If you are intending to grow vegetables, you have to have a minimum of eight hours of full sun per day. So keep that in mind. Also, where is your water source? I had a couple of containers that were way out on the other side of the property, and I realized that I'm not putting them there again because I had to carry the hose wouldn't reach, and I had to carry bucket after bucket full of water. Take a look at where your water is. Uh, do you have animals in the area that you need to plan around? Uh, if there's a deer track coming through a certain part of your neighborhood, maybe you want to put your raised bed on the other side. Uh, what was the site used for before? How many people will be using it? Is the site flat? Is it level? And what is your orientation? Is it east-west or is it north-south? So once you've taken a look at where you're going to put it and how much space you have, then you really need to think about what are you going to build your raised bed out of? And there are lots of options. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's important to use rock resistant or untreated material. Do not use wood that has preservatives in it. Those preservatives can kill the plants that you're trying to grow, or they can leach into the soil and be taken up by the plants. And then anything that is uh, feeding on those plants, not just insects, et cetera, but you, if you're growing vegetables, uh, may be exposed to some of those chemicals. So uh, look for approved um, non-preservative wood if you're planning on using wood. Uh, plastic wood is a great alternative, kind of that Trex material that you see boardwalks and porches made out of. However, it is really expensive. I would love to use it to redo my porch, but um, the price is just prohibitive. But then again, the price of wood has really gone up. Uh, so that may be worth another look. So you're going to create the raised bed. You have your location. You know what you're going to make it out of. And now you have to uh, plan for a certain limited size. The minimum depth that you can get away with is six inches. I would not recommend only six inches. 10 to 14 is uh, much preferable. Uh, the, the more shallow the bed, the more watering you're going to have to do. The width should be no more than four feet. Three is kind of the standard, and it can be as long as you want. Um, six to eight feet is typical and cost-effective, especially if you're buying wood. Um, I think the longest plank, or the longest um, plywood you can get if you're gonna cut it yourself is either eight, is probably eight feet. And remember to leave space, if you're doing more than one bed, leave space in between so that you can get in and out with your tools and the things that, that you might need there. If you are um, having someone either in a wheelchair or on crutches or who needs a chair, you're going to want to leave more than just two or three feet of space between beds. So this is the most expensive, inexpensive and easy to build a uh, bed that I have seen. If you're buying plain wood, keep in mind that you are going to have to replace it as it rots, but you could probably for $50, $60, uh, buy these materials and um, build this structure in about an hour. 
and you would have a raised bed ready to go. Um, I try to look at things in terms of what might you already have at home. I don't know that you have wood at home or rebar, but you certainly have a rubber mallet, some newspaper, cardboard, and uh, at least some soil to get started. We're gonna talk a lot more about soil in a minute. So you don't just have to buy uh, wood uh, from uh, the lumber yard. You can use railroad ties. Uh, you can use logs. Uh, maybe that a lot of trees came down with those terrible winds yesterday. You could cut some of those logs and use them to build your raised bed. Now with railroad ties, you need to be a little bit careful because some of them have been uh, treated with chemicals. You can use brick. I have one made out of pavers. I have two beds made out of pavers uh, and there's no mortar. They're just stacked against each other. Uh, and that works also. You don't have to go for something as nice as this with a you know, mortared wall, et cetera. You can use stone. Um, I do not know how to do this kind of work. If I were going to have something like this done, I'd have to hire somebody. You can use steel. And you can use aluminum. Now, these are um, watering or feeding troughs. I have seen them at my local tractor supply store. Uh, and I, every time I see them, I say, oh, I want one, and I want two, or I want more. And this may be the year that I actually do it. Or you can use cinder block. In terms of something being fast and easy to put together, albeit cinder blocks are heavy, a cinder block uh, raised bed um, is very convenient. Um, you clear the area where you want the bed. You put some weed mat. It doesn't have to be weed mat. It is in this picture, but it does not have to be. You can use cardboard. You can use newspaper. You line up your cinder blocks. Uh, in the bottom pictures, you'll notice that they've actually gone through the trouble of laying down uh, some flat stone to cover the holes in the cinder blocks. You do not have to do that. In fact, if you look at this garden, uh, they're actually, they've actually filled the holes and are using them also as an area for planting. Now, where I used to live um, in Metuchen, I had a cinder block, a fancy cinder block, one with the patterns on the front, similar to what you see in the right-hand picture. And it uh, went across the backyard. And every year, I would plant an impatient inside each and every one. It took forever because I think there were about 110 holes that I had to fill. Uh, here with this, it's much simpler. And of course, on the right, they've gotten rather fancy. They've used two different types of cinder blocks. Um, they have them at different levels and shapes. And they've actually created uh, a, a really nice garden. Um, I thought this was cute. You can make yourself a chair. And not only can you plant in the holes at the top, you can also plant in the holes along the side. Now, some of you may look at that and say, wow, that looks really weird. Um, but in a moment, we're going to be talking about straw bale gardening, and you'll see that uh, you can do it with a straw bale as well. So now you've identified where you want to put it, what material you're going to use, um, and we have to talk about the soil that you're going to put it because you do not, do not want to dig up the soil in your yard and put it in the bed. Um, that is a no-no. You should have soil that is well-drained and you should um, amend it or improve it with compost, uh, uh, some commercially available manures, um, a good rule of thumb is to think about your topsoil mixed with your compost, mixed with your potting soil. Now, last year I made my own soil. I have a small tumbler composter and I mixed compost with organic soil, peat moss, perlite and vermiculite and stirred it and stirred it and added water. And I made my own soil and I did very, very well. 
Uh, you can buy already prepared soils. Uh, please do not, I don't want to say names of companies, but you all know who I'm talking about. Do not buy their soils. Uh, the treatments and supposed fertilizers, et cetera, in them um, are not beneficial to your plants in the long term. If you need to, you can test your soil. Um, if water is an issue, you can very easily learn how to do trickle irrigation. And always remember to add mulch at the top to reduce water loss and to cut down on the weeds. So here's an example of a trickle irrigation system. You buy these in kits, just comes with the different parts and you snap them together and um, attach it to your hose. If you really know what you're doing, you can even put them on a timer so that um, certain beds can get watered at certain times. I do not have any kind of an irrigation system because my property is quite wet. So other than having to water my containers, I typically don't have to water anything out in my beds. Now this one I thought was particularly clever. This person shortened their downspout or their um, water off their roof, ran it into a trough with some rocks in it and allows the water to trickle down through the rocks and waters their bed. Uh, this was very clever because they knew that you couldn't just have the water coming right from the downspout because if it's a heavy rain, that water is gonna come out very forcefully and it's going to dislodge or upset the plants that are closest to it. It's also gonna create uneven watering where you're gonna to have too much closer to the downspout and not enough water at the other end. So I thought that this one was particularly well done. <clears throat> when you're doing a raised bed, you should talk, uh, consider adding a trellis. Now this of course depends on what you're growing, but if you are growing something that needs support or that likes to climb or vine, uh, this can be a very uh, easy way to give that plant the structure that it needs and um, still be easy for you to maintain. Now, the next one I thought was really clever. Uh, these folks used those uh, troughs that I talked about before and created this trellis and they now have actually created a little arbor or a pagoda where you can sit underneath it in the shade. And in addition, if someone were on, say, in a wheelchair, um, they could come inside the structure and then just reach up and be able to harvest whatever happened to be growing. Um, I thought this was very clever because the um, vegetables actually hang down and you're not rummaging around uh, through all of the leaves trying to find what you want to pick. So those are some ideas of trellises. Some gardeners like to protect uh, their crop, especially when it's quite young and it's trying to get rooted and germinated and growing. And uh, there are a lot of different kinds of covers that you can put on. Uh, this one is made of screen and it has the advantage that it will keep out uh, insects that you don't want. It'll keep the rabbits out and the gophers out, et cetera. However, whenever you're covering uh, your plants, keep in mind that you are not allowing the pollinators in there. And what you may be growing may not be able to grow or to fertilize if it doesn't have a pollinator that can get to it. Now this next one <clears throat> has both trellises and covers. Uh, this is a raised bed where they've created an arch over it that is basically PVC pipe. And they've curved it over, um, anchored it in the ground in the corners, and then they have spread some uh, clear tarp over it, almost creating a little greenhouse. Another thing that you can do is you can garden in a mound or a spiral. And if you have a small amount of space, 
Uh, this is a really good way of creating more space. These are very popular for herb gardens. And you start, I guess, well, it doesn't matter, top or the bottom. And you simply go around the spiral, uh, putting in your plants. And then to harvest them, you simply just have to walk around uh, the structure. These are good if you have a limited amount of space and they don't require as many materials to build. Now I had said before that um, I was going to include some information here in terms of accessibility. These you are not going to be building yourself, more likely you'd be buying some of these. Um, so the first one has that cutout as you can see. This one has been done completely circular so that the wheelchair tucks in all the way around it. And I really like the uh, little bucket attachment where you can keep your tools. This one uh, seems a little more awkward at first, but you'll notice that it actually has a shelf that goes all the way around. And uh, behind the man, you'll see that he has his watering can there. So everything is right um, at the level where you need it uh, on this shelf. This one looks quite fancy. And I put it in here for two reasons. You'll notice all of the knobs along the tops of the beds. Um, those are for folks who can pull themselves up out of a wheelchair, or if they have a walker or crutches, those knobs are really good handholds. So people can hold on with one hand and they can work with the other. You'll also notice that the one closest to the foreground and the one farthest away both have water spigots. So whoever put these in really went to a lot of trouble to actually run water out there so that particularly if a person is in a wheelchair, that they could have ready access to water without having to go to wherever the faucet is and back or to drag a hose with them. Here are a couple other ideas in terms of accessibility. On the left, instead of leaving bare ground, they've put in gravel so that it's easier for folks to get around. And on the right, the uh, containers, the beds themselves, have been raised even more by being put on uh, blocks and very thick planks of wood to raise them up. Now, if you are interested in doing one of those um, ones that are kind of like an arbor, here's a really simple idea. You get some large uh, pots and grow your plants in them and give them each their own, um, I think those are bamboo poles, so that they can climb. And as the plants grow, you'll end up with a very nice uh, teepee that you could um, put a chair in or a wheelchair can get in there and uh, have a nice place to sit in the shade and to harvest what you're growing. So on the right, I have a few other ideas in terms of making gardening easier. My husband got me that bench um, the woman in the red slacks is sitting on. And on this side, you can sit on it, but if you turn it over, you can kneel on it and then you have the handles there to help you get back up. I have really bad knees and I have a really bad back and I'm looking forward to using that. Then there are some wheeled varieties and for folks with limited um, hand mobility, there's a new line of garden implements that actually attach to your arm similar to those crutches that you've seen that go around your arm. So I thought these were all very clever ideas. So now you're all set and you have to decide when are you going to plant? It's basically all about temperature. Some plants like cool weather, lettuce, basil, are two of the biggies. As soon as it gets too hot, they don't want to grow anymore. So we're all, I know I'm itching to get out there and I have to keep telling myself to have patience because New Jersey's 
last date for frost is given as May 15th. Now, this has been steadily creeping back and some folks will actually use Mother's Day as the date uh, that they can go ahead and plant plants, but Master Gardeners and Rutgers are sticking to the recommendation that you don't put your garden in until May 15th or later. So most plants will do very well in 60 to 70 degrees. Uh, peas and spinach like it cooler. Eggplant melons like it a little bit warmer. Some plants you're only going to get one crop. So tomatoes you put in your plants, they give you the fruit, you're done. Others, and this is one of the reasons I like to plant lettuce, is you'll get an entire crop and then you can plant another one and you can have a second and sometimes even a third. One note, um, I'll mention it now and it'll come up again later. If you're using raised beds, you cannot plant anything that gets too tall. Remember, you've raised the surface of the ground in your raised bed. So now it's already one, two, three feet higher than the ground and you certainly are not going to be able to reach, say, a corn stalk um, that's now going to be up even higher than that. I'm going to make a plug here uh, for what we call companion planting. One of the ways to get the most out of your uh, raised bed garden is to put certain plants together. And if I can digress for a moment, um, I particularly like this story uh, that's called the Three Sisters. So the Native Americans had a system where they would always plant corn, squash, and string beans together. The corn, growing tall, acted like the trellis for the beans. The beans are nitrogen fixers. They improve the quality of the soil and provide nutrients to the corn and the squash. And the squash, by spreading out across the ground and having larger leaves, would block the sun and help control weeds and would also uh, act to conserve water and provide some shade. Um, I don't grow vegetables. I don't have a vegetable garden. I'm doing um, formal and informal flower gardens. But if I ever do put in my own vegetable garden, I'm definitely going to try this. I want to see it in action. All right. If you have a small amount of space and limited um, amount of materials, you should consider a technique called square foot gardening. I've seen these um, in three by three feet. This is a four by four and you partition it out. You don't even have to put the, the grid lines in it. And in each section, you put a different plant. Uh, and you can have your entire, or your salad fixings, your dinner fixings, um, all together in this one structure. Now, some folks get a little carried away and will do something like this. Here you have your, your square foot plots. Uh, your trellises, and they've managed to get a hose all the way out there for the water. Uh, keep in mind, even if you're growing just uh, vegetables, that you need to invite pollinators. There's quite a bit of noise. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know what's going on there. Um, Consider planting some additional flowers, uh, particularly natives, to attract the birds and the butterflies. Uh, they will help pollinate whatever it is that you're growing. And some of these plants can even warn you if you have a problem. I don't know if you've been to the wineries and you've noticed that the, at the end of each row of grapevines that they'll have perhaps a rose bush or something else. And those are used so that if an insect pest is coming into the garden, it will be attracted to that plant first. It's kind of like the favorite. And that acts as a signal um, to the 
grape grower or the gardener that an insect has made it into the garden and it gives you a warning so you can take care of it before they get to the actual plants that you're trying to protect. So I would like to tell you a little bit about a um, very inexpensive uh, hey, type of... I'm visiting. Can we, can you mute yourself, whoever that is, please? Don't worry, I got him. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is called straw bale gardening. And, um, and uh, another master gardener in my group um, actually has set this up in a huge scale, 20, 30, 40 bales, uh, and is doing it for a client of hers who wanted a uh, garden and they decided to set it up this way. It has several advantages. Um, it can keep your plants warmer so you get a longer growing season. You can plant on the sides. Remember that chair, the cinder block chair with the plants on the sides? You can do the same thing here with the straw bales. Because you're not using soil, you are not introducing any soil borne diseases. These are, um, they generate fewer weeds. They're easier to weed. They're great for small spaces. Uh, you can put them even where the ground is very wet, which is the problem I have. And some folks uh, like to put their tropical bulbs in straw bales. I have a lot of elephant ear bulbs and I will put them out. And in the fall, I have to dig them all up, clean them off and store them in the garage for the winter because they will not survive in New Jersey winter. That digging them out part can be really difficult. If you put your tropical bulbs in straw bales, all you do is pull the straw apart and you get your bulb out very easily. So there are, however, some disadvantages. Um, they can dry out quickly, so you need to water more often. You have to provide additional fertilizer. Uh, there isn't enough in just the straw itself. So you have to add conditioners such as compost. Your bales will only last you one or two years, so you'll have to replace them. And you're going to have to take all your old straw bales and you're going to have to get rid of that material. And it can be quite a lot of it. So you need to think ahead and say, what am I going to do with these straw bales when I can't use them anymore? Uh, you need to make sure that nothing else is growing up and into them. And perhaps the, um, oh, and you're only gonna plant annuals. You obviously cannot plant a perennial, something that's going to come back year after year in a straw bale that is only going to have a two year life. But the most important thing to know when you're talking about um, straw bale gardening is actually getting the right straw. So a lot of people use straw and hay interchangeably and they are not interchangeable words. Uh, for this type of gardening, you want to make sure that you are using straw that comes from the plants that are listed there. Uh, you do not want um, the corn, linseed, flax, or in particular, hay. So I used to live in Metuchen, and many years ago, I secured a sizable grant for an urban reforestation project. And we had some trees planted. I cleaned an area along the roadside on Route 27. We had some trees planted. We had some shrubbery planted. And of course, the area had been disturbed. And so we wanted it protected until the grass could grow. And we um, had our, the contractor said he was putting down straw. Well, it wasn't straw. It was hay. And it had the seed heads on it. And we had an entire area all the way along Route 27 that was growing hay. Um, this, we couldn't get rid of it. It created a problem because it got tall and the other plants that we wanted to be there uh, got crowded out. So really important that you make sure that you're getting the right material. 
So you're going to put down your, your bale. Um, you can put it right on concrete. If you're going to put it in an area that is soil or grass, you need to put something underneath it. And I've given you a list of some options of what you can put down underneath. So you're going to set it up. You're going to pick your pattern where, where they're going to go. You always put it with the narrow cut side up. And you leave the string or the twine or whatever it is that's holding it together. Because if you take that apart, your whole straw bale just falls apart. So you want to leave it all um, tied together. And if you have a slope, you can actually do straw bale gardening on a slope, but you have to make sure that the bales go up and down the slope, not across. If you put them across, then they can simply fall over and roll away. So once you have your bales and you've put them where you want them, they have to be watered with some liquid fertilizer added, and then you wait a couple weeks. You monitor the temperature. It should get really high up to about 150 Fahrenheit, and then it drops off. At that point, you should start seeing some black compost and some small mushrooms appearing. Now at Master Gardeners, we've gotten calls, oh no, my straw bales are ruined, there's mushrooms growing in them. That's actually a really good sign. It means that you now have created a really good um, soil or material that is starting to break down and therefore the nutrients are available for the plants that you want to put in there. Okay. So um, again, you do not want to plant top heavy plants like corn. You also do not want to use running or vining plants that spread by offshoots because they're going to start going through the straw bales every which way. So here's a really long list of the kinds of plants that you can put in a straw bale. And um, I'm sure that there are many more other than just what's here. Now, there are some recommendations for how many plants per straw bale. So if you want to grow, say, squash, you can only put two plants in a straw bale. But if you are planting beans, you can do five or more plants per straw bale. And this is to allow the plants both enough room for their roots and enough room for all of the foliage. Um, and they don't get crowded in. This also provides enough space around the leaves for air circulation so that you're eliminating some of the, um, the molds and the mildews. So here's what it looks like um, when it's set up. And what I really like about this picture, it's, it's a silly thing, but um, I've had issues with it in the past. You see the little white sticks sticking up? Those are plant tags. Uh, my number one tip for gardeners is keep your plant tags so that you know what's where. Uh, I had an issue with this with my husband clipped some things for me and brought them in and they accidentally got mixed with something else and he didn't know what they were and I didn't know what they were. And I ended up making dried herbs and realized that I had two or three different kinds of herbs in this mix and I didn't know what was in there and I couldn't take it apart. Um, it ended up tasting great on pork chops. So in the end, we found a use for it. But now that we realize that we really like it, I can't recreate it. So tag everything and these little sticks work just fine. As an example of how easy it is to grow in a straw bale, check this out. So here are your plants in the straw bale and um, next to them and a little, there's, I think one of those in the back is the same kind of plant. And you'll notice that the ones in the straw bale have done much, much better than the others. And peek for a second at the top right part of the picture. You see those white bags? We're gonna come back to those white bags or something similar to them in a second. So you could see from the plants in the front that this has been um, very effective in growing. These, I, I want to say eggplant, but I uh, can't swear to it. But without a doubt, the most clever straw bale gardening technique I have ever seen is this one. 
The straw bale is the perfect size for this shopping cart. And this has the added advantage of being able to be moved uh, to where the sun is. Being able to move your plants or put your plants where the sun is, is one of the real advantages of container gardening. You can put your containers uh, where you have sun, irrespective of what else happens to be in that area. It can be on your pavers, it can be on your deck, it can be on your driveway, uh, it can be on the stairs, it doesn't really matter. There are a lot of advantages to containers. Uh, you don't have to dig or till the soil. Because you can put your own soil in, you're not introducing any weeds. Um, you can put them where you want. However, there are some distinct disadvantages. Many of these containers are very heavy. And there's a rule that every container, every day. And that means every day you have to water every container. Uh, you also have to add fertilizer. The plants that grow in these containers are using the nutrients that are in that soil. So the second year, now that plant has starting with less nutrients and the third year, et cetera. So each year you really have to amend that soil a bit, uh, give it more compost or more uh, slow release fertilizer uh, to keep things going. So where can you put your containers? Well, again, if you're trying to grow vegetables, you need eight to 10 hours of sunlight. A cool season plant, maybe like a basil, um, and there are others, uh, you can get away with six hours. But most plants, unless they're specific for shade areas, most things that you would be trying to grow in your garden are going to want sun. Make sure wherever you put them, you have access to water. Save your plant tags. And uh, some folks learned this the hard way. Put something underneath the containers. Uh, they will leak and drip, and that draining water can stain your deck or your concrete. Uh, so consider putting trays underneath. And I have very large um, uh, ceramic containers, and they're incredibly heavy. And then you fill them with all of the soil, and they're virtually impossible to move. So I purchased um, these very heavy duty uh, wheeled dollies uh, that the ceramic pots are on. And the ones I purchased were rated for, I think 250 or 300 pounds. Um, so I knew that it was really going to be able to handle the weight of these containers, which I think were about half of that weight, but it was well worth the investment. Some of the less expensive dollies, uh, they don't last a year. So I just went ahead and bought the really good ones. So what types of containers can you use? Well, just about anything. I know the plastic ones are very popular because they come in a lot of different colors and shapes and they're lightweight and inexpensive. Uh, clay, ceramic, and concrete are all long lasting, but uh, very heavy. And some of them can be expensive. I do not um, advocate the use of metal containers. Uh, the really large trough ones that I showed you before that come from Tractor Supply, those are okay because they're so big that the soil inside doesn't get overheated. Um, but metal containers otherwise, particularly the smaller they are, uh, the hotter they get and the plants will simply not survive in them. And um, I really like the, the picture in the lower right. I would not have recommended this because remember you want a minimum of six inches. I guess that's barely six inches, but that's a kiddie pool or a pool you might buy to put outside to let your, your dog cool off in, in the summer. It seems to have worked quite well for this person. Now, a couple of pictures back, I asked you to pay attention to those white bags in the upper right corner. And I came upon these, um, this is this guy, uh, it's called Epic Gardening. He's on Facebook and he does some really amazing things. 
And he had mentioned this. I said, what is he talking about? Let me go and see. Well, they're called grow bags. And they fold almost completely flat. You can put them away. They have handles on the side. And um, I just had to put a picture of this up here uh, because these are made for anything that has big tubers roots that like potatoes or sweet potatoes. So they actually open on one side. I, I was just amazed that somebody thought of that. Um, but these are certainly lighter than some of the other container types. And with the handles, if you need to pick it up and move it or even put it on a dolly, you just pull it. Um, this will get you more hours of sun uh, if you don't have a, the sun that you need in just one place. Now, the biggest problem with containers, I said before, was every container every day, you have to water them. So then someone came up with this idea of self-watering containers. Uh, this is a new idea. And instead of having a drainage hole at the bottom, uh, these containers have overflows that capture the water and then reuse it. Um, I had not seen these in the store. Maybe I haven't gone out looking for them uh, this year, I will. But uh, if you're handy, you can actually build a simple one yourself. And here's an example. You can take some uh, plastic rubber uh, or PVC in the bottom of a large bucket, uh, put a, um, this is an, an old fashioned type of trivet or colander. You put that on top and you'll see in the top picture, kind of at say 10 o'clock, uh, that's where your spigot has been drilled through. And here is a diagram uh, of the design that you're trying to achieve. There are your black rubber pieces, your colander on top. Um, and this can help you, you still have to add water. Eventually the water's all going to evaporate or be used by the plant, um, but it saves you having to water quite as much or quite as often. Now, as with raised beds, the depth of a container matters. Um, I pointed out before that I was surprised that that kiddie pool was working because it was really rather shallow. Uh, you, depending on the plant, if you're growing uh, some, some small lettuce uh, greens and some of the smaller herbs, uh, you can get away with four to six inch depth. Uh, where it says herbs, um, that does not include basil. My basil gets root bound. I can barely give it a pot big enough before the darn thing gets root bound again. It really, really needs a large pot to do well. Uh, but the depth and the size, how many gallons of space are inside of it, um, will then tell you what plants will or won't do well in that size. For example, if you're growing a full size regular tomato plant, you need a 15 gallon container. And here are some um, kind of ideas about what size pot do you need and how many plants can you get in it. And again, you'll see tomatoes, five gallons, only one plant. Um, others, beans, for example, uh, you can get um, two or three plants in a container. Uh, unless it's a very small rooted plant, I typically make sure that each plant has its own space. The only things that I tend to clump together are um, lettuce and obviously carrots. The carrot seeds are so small that you just kind of put them there and hope for the best. So if you, uh, I like it, uh, do it yourself uh, and you wanna do this the easy way, you can get some old pallets to put down, some big, big buckets. Uh, these are then set up with a uh, trellis overhead um, that has been secured so that it can handle the weight um, of those melons. From the screen before, can I go backwards? Do I dare? You'll see that if you're growing melons, I guess the closest here is uh, squash you really need that only one plant per container. And that's what you have here. Each of these containers 
has uh, one melon plant in it. Now for containers, because they're typically so much smaller than a raised bed, you really, really need to pay attention to the soil you're putting in it. Do not use garden soil. Uh, it doesn't drain well. It brings in seeds from weeds, diseases that might be in the soil. You really want to purchase what are called soil-less mix mixtures. Uh, one of my favorites is ProMix. Uh, these are lightweight, they drain really well, they hold water and nutrients, and they're already pH balanced. Uh, so I would, I would recommend that, um, unless you're going to make your own, as I explained earlier with compost and peat moss and vermiculite, etc. Because there's a limited amount of soil and therefore a limited amount of nutrients available to the plants that you're growing, you have to fertilize. Your soil depletion occurs much more quickly um, when you're gardening at this small scale. So you have to add uh, compost, top dressing soil, you can water with compost tea. Uh, the other thing you should keep track of what have you planted where uh, and rotate those crops. So don't plant the same type of plant in the same container year after year and make sure that you add uh, more organic matter. So now you've got your location, you've got your right size containers, you've decided what to plant in them. Oh, now you have to decide what to plant in them. So you can grow just about anything. Uh, I like salad greens, my peppers did really well last year. Um, I had cucumbers that did well last year. Uh, and one of my particular favorites, I planted uh, red noodle beans and they did fabulously. Try not to plant something that takes up the whole space and you only get one harvest. So if you have a, con a, a container and you've put a broccoli plant in it, you're going to harvest that broccoli the one time and then that's it, you're done. So try to select plants that have more um, frequent provi provide, providing um, foods to you. Like you can always pick beans and you can always pick tomatoes. And look for bush or dwarf varieties so that they don't get so tall. You can even find fruit trees in dwarf varieties, and I've listed some of them here. Uh, these, they will tell you sometimes in the garden centers that they do not need to cross pollinate. Um, that may be true, but only true to a limited extent. These small fruit trees will always do better if they can cross pollinate. So always buy at least two if you're going to try this. So you want to choose varieties that have really high yields. Uh, those are things like radishes, lettuce, greens, spinach, uh, vertically growing plants. You can also grow plants that vine and you can add a trellis. Uh, I cheated a little bit. Those are uh, red noodle beans in the picture on the right. And I actually took a tomato cage and I put it inside the uh, big, huge ceramic pot. And my red noodle beans were quite happy to vine their way up all around the tomato cage. And of course, you can grow flowers in containers. <clears throat> and you can put containers everywhere. Every small space, provided it has a certain amount of sun, is an opportunity for you to show off and grow something. It can be a balcony, a roof, a deck, a windowsill, your driveway, even the walls uh, you can plant on. Uh, your mailbox, put something around the mailbox, the walkway. I had a, a presenter once uh, who lived in a uh, community where everyone had to follow certain rules about what they could or couldn't do on their property. And they were told that they were not allowed to grow any vegetables uh, in the front. They could only have gardens in the back. 
So instead of planting, say, rows of flowers along the walkway to her front door, she planted all of it with herbs. And so she had her herb garden along the walkway uh, to her house. Uh, you can even hang uh, garden boxes, et cetera, from your fence. Take a moment uh, when you're considering where to put your containers that you might want to match them um, for a little style or just visual coherence so it doesn't look like just a jumble. And if you feel that you're going to have to move your containers uh, to sunnier spots because you don't quite have enough sun, you can even do something as simple as those plastic containers that they sell, you know, Target, Walgreens, wherever, the storage ones, you just don't need the top for it, you just use the bottom part. And um, I thought this is very clever. This is what an old fashioned wheelbarrow. They tended to be much deeper than the ones that you get now. Um, but not only does it look stylish uh, and decorative, you could actually pick it up and move it if the plants inside uh, need some more light. Now, sometimes I'm asked with these containers, uh, do you have to cover them? Because with the raised beds, you'll recall that there were certain suggestions for covering them. And I thought this was very clever, these clear umbrellas. Um, and this is good protection when the plants are first getting started. Uh, it keeps the temperature up if it's still cool out, it keeps the water in. However, uh, once the plants have started, uh, you really shouldn't keep these on. It can get too warm and too wet inside. And again, uh, it doesn't allow access for the pollinators to get in there and do their thing. And Containers uh, need a little bit of TLC. Don't look at a container and think you can only put one thing in it. You can actually put uh, an edible plant with some flowers. Uh, you can keep containers closely packed together uh, to help them control the humidity and the temperature, but you're still going to have to water them. And if you have any problems with your containers, you're going to have to disinfect them. And typically just washing them or rinsing them in a 10% bleach solution will do the trick. I have two containers that I tried to grow artichoke in last year and the leaves would come out and they were gorgeous and then they would just wither and die. And so this year I'm going to throw out the soil that was in there. I'm going to bleach the containers and I have to start over. Um, I don't think the fault was with the plant. I think the fault was something uh, in the container itself. And if you don't want to do any of this yourself and you've got a lot of money, you can buy one of these. I saw this at the Philadelphia Flower Show. Um, I guess a couple it has to be at least two years ago because they didn't have it last year or this year. And it's called a Vegipod. And the whole thing comes, I believe you just have to put it together and it does everything for you. Uh, it has a cover, um, it has uh, air ventilation, it's self-watering, um, you can have them put on wheels so that you can move it around. Uh, it's, it's really, it even has a, a mister at the top. Um, there, it's a container garden, um, they're easy to fill and to use and to maintain, uh, but as I said before, uh, they can be really pricey. And that's why I wanted to give you some other options on less expensive ways to build a raised bed um, or different types of containers to buy. So with that, uh, if you'd like to jot down this particular website, uh, this is for uh, Rutgers. Um, Rutgers is what's called a land grant college. Each state has one. They were set up in the 1800s. And that's why Rutgers is New Jersey's land grant college. And they have a large agriculture uh, department. And that's where they run the master gardener programs uh, across the state. And in particular, the one in Middlesex County because Rutgers is in Middlesex County. They have a variety of publications. And of course, they also have the Master Gardener Helpline that you can call um, and have your questions answered or that you can email and have your questions answered. 
and my friend Esther, uh, who embarked on this whole process with me uh, when we decided to go to Master Gardening Certification class, uh, she and I uh, answer the helpline every second and fourth Friday. So if you want to save your questions for the second and fourth Friday, you can actually get an answer from myself or from Esther Yeager. Uh, so that is my presentation. And let me see if I can escape here. And then I have to stop sharing. And are we back? We're back. We're back. We're back. Well, thank you so we much. For thank you for having me. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Sure. Let's see. So this question is from Kelsey. She was asking, what is the purple plant on the screen right now? So that was the slide where you had, what can you grow in a container? It was a little- I do not know. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, did it look like purple beans? Yes. Okay. That was either a type of eggplant or more likely a type of, um, they're coming in purple now. You can get purple. I don't think it's a purple zucchini. There's purple beans, a strain of purple green beans. So they wouldn't be green beans, they'd be purple beans. Um, or eggplant is most likely, but I can't swear to it. Right, it's a better answer than what I had. So that's so <laughs> Why, what did you have? I thought they were hot peppers that were purple. I don't know. I'm not I suppose that is possible because those, those, um, those hot peppers can come in a variety of colors. Typically, you think of them as oranges and reds and yellows, but I wouldn't be surprised. And then um, Marion asks, any tips on what to do to avoid critters digging in the containers every day? Mm. Uh, these are questions that we get a lot, and you have to know what the critter is. Um, I until this past year, really hadn't had that much trouble with anything getting into my containers. And this past year, it actually happened over the winter. I have my pots out on the porch and I just put them up against the house. And uh, the squirrels have decided that they're going to come upstairs because it's a second floor porch. And they now come upstairs and they dug and put things in my containers. And I have no idea what I'm going to actually grow this year. Um, I have put mulch, a layer of mulch, um, to deter them. And I've also put um, tomato cages. And then in one particular plant that the rabbit was getting up and reaching itself up to eat, um, I took some um, a mesh material and I wrapped it around. So I put, say, um, some wooden sticks or in, in a square inside the container and then put this mesh around to keep them from being able to get up and in. Uh, but the first thing you need to know is what creature is it? Because what you'll do for a chipmunk is different from what you'll do for a rabbit, say. Yes, a lot of people in the chat are giving their suggestions and they're kind of like a combination of what you yeah. just did. You um, have to play around with it and see what works for you. Yes. and. Um, a lot of people are highlighting that it's mostly squirrels or cats or chipmunks. Mm -hmm. um, cats, cats can be a tough one. Uh, typically, they're not going to get in a plant in, in a container unless they are using it as a litter box. Um, and then you have a problem because if they are, you really need to clean that out. Yeah. Um, the, there are some, I never advocate the use of chemicals. As a matter of fact, um, in a couple of weeks, I'm giving a presentation on gardening without the use of any chemicals whatsoever. Um, I will not use them on my property, but there are some sprays if you have a really serious problem. There's this one uh, line of sprays where each spray is for a different creature. So some of the commercially available sprays, you spray them and they claim, oh, we're gonna get rid of everything. Um, but if you buy one that's really been targeted to the cats or to the bunnies, um, you, have, you have better success that way. 
There's also other tricks. Um, if you have a mouse or a bowl or a mole problem, you plant onions or garlic around the entire edge of your raised bed. And the creatures don't like the onion and the garlic. And it acts like a kind of a barrier to what you planted inside of that. All right. I think like your answer and the combination of everyone's suggestions in the chat, hopefully we'll get to some sort of res resolution. <laughs> um, then Vince asks, is, what do you use to top off raised beds each year? Uh, I've been using, um, I've been using mulch, but uh, the mulch that I have delivered is all natural. Uh, it is not, uh, it's, it's shredded wood. Um, it's not wood chips and there's no dye in it. Um, I was using supposed mulch from the township, uh, but what ends up happening is they put just about anything and you'll get uh, you'll get weeds, you'll get poison ivy. I happen to be incredibly, like almost go to the hospital allergic to poison ivy. And so I discovered that I cannot use uh, the mulch that comes free from the town. Um, but that's, that's my issue. Um, I, use, I use mulch and I use a um, pellet, it's called Osmo Coat. Um, it's a pellet fertilizer and you just work it in uh, to the soil right around the plant, and it's a very slow release um, fertilizer. Um, Ma in the chat asks, is what kind? Did you say the name? Uh, 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 it's, um, it's wood mulch. It's shredded wood. It's not, um, and it's not dyed. I think you've all seen that, that the black mulch or the orange mulch um, those all have dyes in them. My landscaper once brought the black mulch because he thought that it looked really sharp, you know, with the green plants against it. And I had a white dog and the mulch smelled kind of funny and the dog decided he's going to go rolling around in it and I, my white dog turned black. No. So, um, never again. I didn't realize it was dyed. Uh, so now we just use straight shredded wood or wood chips. It's also, uh, if you're up for it, one of the best things that you can do in the fall is gather all of your leaves, put them through a shredder and put them right back out into your beds and leave them there. And they will go right into the ground and they'll do all the things that mulch does, um, but it was free. It fell out of the trees. It is, however, quite a bit of work. And um, Vince, who asked originally, what do you top off with? Mm -hmm. He said, um, so not organic soil and manure? I have not used manure. Um, I have, I've used the compost and the fertilizer and the mulch. Um, you have to be very careful with manure and where it's coming from. Um, you can only use cow and horse is okay, um, but People think that you can use just about any manure and you really can't. You're introducing, potentially introducing some pathogens that you don't want in your garden. Um, but certainly I have, I have, you have no idea. I have huge, huge areas. I, when we, we fell in love with the house, I didn't necessarily fall in love with all the gardening that this place requires. Um, but we have really huge areas. And so I try not to have to do something like that because it would involve so much material that would have to be delivered and spread out. Um, and the gardens were in such bad shape that I have other priorities right now. Um, we had to pull a lot of plants, so I have to put a lot of new plants in. Uh, so one step at a time. But you can, in fact, manure is one of the better things that you can do. I'd say compost and manure would be the two best. And then two more questions. Uh, sure. Pamela asks is a follow up with the mulch question. What about rubber mulch? The only thing I have seen rubber used for uh, is making paths. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by rubber mulch. Um, there, there are some products that are, it's almost like putting a garbage bag down 
and then the, you have a hole and the plant comes up through the hole. Those are great for weed control, uh, but they get really hot. And uh, rubber is not, is not natural. Um, I don't know why you would be introducing something like that into your garden. Mm -hmm. I've never seen that other than where you're walking. Great. And then um, last question. So Karen asks is, I used one of those gardening kit containers complete with dirt last year, also with a water pipe. Do I have to put all new dirt to use it again this year or just fertilizer? I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I made all my own dirt. I've used it last year. I'm using it again this year. What I found is that it's settled. And I know that the plants growing in there used up a lot of nutrients. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some more because I make my own soil. I'm going to make some more and I'm going to mix it into say the top six to eight inches of each pot um, so that there's fresh material in there and so that it's gotten a little bit filled up because what I found is everything sunk uh, in the container. And I'm not planning on emptying. I have containers, huge ones. I'm not planning on emptying them and bleaching and doing all of that. Where I know that there's been a problem with two smaller pots, then I'm throwing everything out and starting over. Um, but certainly you can, you can keep using them. Um, you don't just add additional fertilizer or compost one year to the next. In a container, you have to do it a couple of times during the growing season. So get the Osmocote, read the instructions. Um, you don't just do it once in a container. You probably have to do it two or three times. Probably twice would be my, depending on the size. All right. And on that note, that will be our last question for the evening. We had a lot Hi. of great questions, a lot of great suggestions, people talking to each other in the chat and giving gardening oh. tips to each other. So super helpful and super great. Um, like I said in the chat earlier, this presentation will, it was recorded and it will be sent out in a follow-up email tomorrow. So if you missed anything or you wanna go back to anything or you wanted to hear your answer to your question again, everything will be available on our Woodbridge Library's YouTube page and specifically in an email sent to you. All okay. right. But, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Pat. And thank you. I hope you we're everybody. all excited to get out there. I yes, know I am. Big gardening. <laughs> Definitely. Great being in the house. All right, good night, yeah. everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you.